Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining this morning or this afternoon, where depending on which side of the country you're in. I am uh, in Southern Oregon, fortunately a little ways away from the current fires that are burning out of control about 90 miles to the east of us, but in our area it's still, it's still looking like a pleasant Southern Oregon summer. So um, this uh, doing presentations this way is certainly different than doing live ones, as you've all probably experienced over the last couple of years in this whole COVID adventure. Uh, so I've kind of modified this presentation, which I've done before in a conference setting, um, to, to hopefully make it still effective. And I labeled this plays well with others because we all know and we all hear about the importance of the effective domain and teaching and training the infected domain and instilling some of those priorities in our students. And I think this ties in really well to that. Um, but it also just ties into some really basic concepts of making learning more effective for our students, engaging students in more effective ways, uh, and trying to do things in a way that, whereby the learning is going to translate into skills that they can readily apply in the future. And, and that's kind of the key of this, right? And so I'm going to talk about, um, I'll start by going over some basic principles of sort of what I believe about effective education and how that applies to some scenario stuff. And then we'll come around to some information um, about how you can sort of integrate your students, make them do a lot of the work, make them actively a part of both scenario creation as well as scenario completion, um, and how that can, can contribute to the way we, we do our training. And, and so I'll, I'll, I'll work my way into that. Um, as Rio mentioned, I will try to kind of keep an eye on the chat um, box. And if I see questions that are relevant and should be answered right then, I will. If I either just miss them or it's something I think we can save to the end, I'll do that. But I'll definitely try to leave time um, for us to do some some Q&A stuff at the end um, of this. Um, I've, I've discovered that through this whole Zoom adventure that I'm not very good at some aspects of multitasking, like watching the little chat box on the side while I'm doing a presentation and trying to pay attention to my notes. I had had a student recently accuse me of having early onset Alzheimer's and uh, I had to explain to him part of that educational process that at my age, it's not considered early onset anymore. So I'm not, but I'm not sure he's not right. Um, Anyway, so we're going to move right ahead here and, and get into this content. Um, so I'll start with this basic premise, which is that your students are probably smarter than you are. And I'll let you think about that for a second, then I'll finish my sentence, which is your their students are probably smarter than you're giving them credit for. And I say that because we need to recognize and remember that all of our students come into our classes or our training sessions with some experience base. It may be specific to EMS, it may include years of EMS experience, or it may be no EMS experience whatsoever or very limited, but they've got life experience. And those experiences, those learnings, the things that they've done previously in or out of our discipline are the things that shape who they are, they shape their understanding about the things they encounter, and it shapes how they will react to things that we're presenting. And we really need to, to keep in that in mind. And one of the challenges I think for us as educators is figuring out how we can effectively tie into that, how we can tap into those prior experiences effectively and do our training and our teaching in ways that are gonna build on those prior experiences and put the pieces together to help them become more proficient care providers. And that's really what this is all about. So we talk about simulation. When I've done this as a live conference, I always ask, you know, how many of you do simulation? If I'm talking to a group of EMS educators, you would think that every hand ought to go up in the room um, and they don't. And I think a lot of that has to do with how we define um, simulation. And I would argue that probably all of you do simulations if you do EMS training. And so for example, from the, you know, the first first aid class you taught or, or EMT class, if you have one student pretend like their arm is broken so another student can practice splinting, that's a simulation. You know, simulation is just that, it's simulating a real experience. The question is, what level do we take it to? How involved do we get? How much do we put into creating that? Um, I'll talk about this a little more in a minute, but it's important to think about how we define simulation. And it's not about the mannequin. It's not about the technology that we use. It's about creating realistic learning experiences for our students in order to prepare them effectively for what they're gonna do in the field. 
So what I want to talk about today is how we do that better, how we get the most bang for our buck and the best use of our time. And I'm going to challenge you to think a little bit about some of the things that you do and some different ways you might be able to do things that can benefit your students uh, and improve your training. And, and that's always my goal is, is just trying to figure out how do we do this better. So hopefully we can all agree that it's important to have goals. And you can set that bar wherever you want. I think this picture is really funny because that kind of matches up with the National Registry's philosophy, right? That the National Registry says we're supposed to produce minimally competent providers. And so by that token, above average is, is a notch above that. That's better, right? So that's above average, is above minimally competent. Um, I don't know about all of you, but most of my graduates, most of my students and graduates are going to end up doing EMS in my community, meaning they might be the ones that show up at my house when I call 911 or someone in my family does. And minimally competent just doesn't cut it. I like to set that goal a little higher and set that bar higher. But regardless of exactly whether you're talking about a program goal or a specific learning objective in one class session, you need to have a goal. You have to have a goal in mind so that you can write clear objectives so that you can decide for yourself, what is the point of this? There's got to be a point to your simulation. There's got to be a point to what you're accomplishing. It can't just be playtime and let's just throw out some calls that sort of resemble something we've seen in the field. Each one of these should really be designed based on our learning objectives. So when we talk about goals for simulation or goals for our students in simulation, typically what we're talking about is learning, right? We want them to learn whatever that objective is of the, of the simulation, but more importantly, we want them to retain it and we want them to be able to recall it when needed so that they can apply it effectively in the future. And so it's about the initial learning, but more importantly about retention and recall. That retention and recall is the piece that we're really after because we can teach these things. And I've heard instructors say that they can't understand why their students fail the final test. And they, and they say, but I taught them that. And my argument was say, well, apparently not. Apparently not very effectively. If they can't recall it effectively when they need it, then we haven't really succeeded in teaching it effectively. And so we have to look at all of those pieces. And then tied into that, we also are really being emphasized these days that we need to teach affective behaviors. And that's a tough one, right? We've talked about that in a lot of, of NEMSI um, conferences and, com and, and classes that I've been in the past is, is how do you teach a, someone to be a decent human being? How do you teach people to talk nice and play well with others? And, and, and that's, it feels like that should have been their parents' job, right? Their parents should have taught them those things. Well, the reality is a lot of our students come to us seriously lacking in those skills and they're, it, they are learned skills. They are things we can teach and we need to be teaching to make sure that we're provider, that we're creating competent, caring, compassionate providers because that's so important to effective EMS. So to kind of give you an idea of where I'm coming from, I've been doing EMS for 37 years, doesn't seem real when I say it, um, and I've been teaching full-time for the last 16. And just last year, I finished a master's degree in adult education through Colorado State University, which is a phenomenal program. If anybody's interested in going down that path, I'd be happy to share information about it. I was very impressed with their program. And I realized I should have done that 16 years ago when I started teaching. I really wish I would have had more of that information earlier because there's a lot of lessons that I learned um, the hard way as, as other educators have done. Um, but I'm fascinated by the science of learning and evidence-based educational practices. We know, any of us that have been doing EMS for a while know that we're on this evolution towards evidence-based interventions, right? We're seeing more of that in emergency medicine and more of it in EMS that we're really looking to, can we choose interventions based on good solid evidence of what works? I think we need to do the same thing in education and not just in EMS education, but education across the board in this country is incredibly antiquated in our approach. And there's been a lot of research. There's over 50 years worth of data out there that tells us about effective education and what works in education, what works in adult education. And there are specific evidence-based practices that we can look at to make sure that we're doing our job as well as we can. Just like you don't want to go out in the field and just sort of wing it, we got to do what we know has been proven to be effective in our educational endeavors, we should do it the same way. We should go and look and see what's been proven. What do we know works and what do we know doesn't work? And one of the things that doesn't work is lecture. 
a canned lecture format where you stand up front and dump knowledge into your audience is the least effective way of educating adult learners. That's been shown over and over again, and you look at any university in the country, and that is the predominant model of how we teach, even though we have clear evidence, it's the least effective way we can teach. So I think we need to challenge ourselves to get out of those ruts, try some different things, um, and EMS lends itself really well to some of those new and creative things or different things than what we've seen before. So I can't cover obviously the breadth of, of the things that I'm talking about in terms of educational theory, but what I am gonna do is cover a few of these that I think are very important and relevant for EMS educators and especially relevant as we're talking about simulations and scenario training. And that's these four, and I'll go through each one of them a little bit, but that's deliberate practice, sometimes called purposeful practice, contextual learning, objective assessment, and feedback. So those are the four I'm going to talk about a little bit, and then we'll get into some of the sort of the nuts and bolts of, of how you apply some of that. So the first one I mentioned is deliberate practice. And this is very different than rote practice. You hear people talk about um, practice makes perfect. Well, Effective practice may make for proficiency, but just rote practice, doing something over and over again does not mean you're gonna get good at it. Doing something over and over again when you did it wrong from the first step and continue to do it wrong means you get very consistent and reliably consistent at doing it wrong. And so it's gotta be more than just rote practice. And what we're really talking about here is a designed approach to repetition, a designed approach to improve performance. And yes, there is repetition. There's a lot of repetition, right? So you got to do a lot of practice. I have a banner across the wall of our labs, our skills lab that says, don't practice until you get it right. Practice until you can't get it wrong. And that's kind of underlies our philosophy of we want lots and lots of repetition. So in a presentation, I often ask the audience, you know, how many hours or how many repetitions does it take to actually become an expert or to actually master something? And I can tell you that the times that I've had this conversation, every single time someone has raised their hand and said 10,000, 10,000 hours. If you're not familiar with that concept, a guy named Malcolm Gladwell wrote about this. Anders Ericsson is actually a psychologist who came up with this proposition originally that it takes 10,000 hours or 10,000 repetitions of doing a task to truly master it. Well, that concept got a lot of press and a lot of publicity, and a lot of people have been talking about that for a long time, but it since has been pretty effectively debunked in that what we really know is that road practice, repetition, probably makes up about 12 to 15% of the mastery of most skills. So it really isn't a major factor. It is a factor. And we all know that there are skills that you don't need to do 10,000 times to master or to at least become very proficient at. And there's other things that may take much more than 10,000 hours. If you want to become a world-class concert pianist, it probably takes way more than 10,000 hours of practice over a lifetime to actually reach that height or that pinnacle for most. So the point is there's no magic number to how many times or how much practice, but we know it takes a lot of repetition. But the key for deliberate practice or purposeful practice is there has to be feedback. There has to be a reflection process. The student has to have an opportunity to think about what they're doing, figure out if it's working, adjust their approach accordingly, and practice more. And a lot of times they need outside feedback to accomplish that. They need that expert opinion pointing out where they need to fine tune, how they need to improve. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that review and assessment process, which is obviously key to this. Another key concept that ties into this deliberate practice that I think we kind of gloss over sometimes is the idea of spaced repetition. And spaced repetition is simply meaning that it's more effective to do little chunks of practice with a break in between than it is to do big chunks of road practice or deliberate practice even. That if you go and practice something for two hours versus 15 minutes a day over eight days, maybe the same total amount of time, your brain processes that more effectively, retains it more effectively, the muscle memory is more concrete. It's more effective to do small incremental practice 
with spacing in between while you can be practicing on other things than it is to do big chunks of practice. And I think that's important and something that we can easily build in to the way we do our skills teaching and our skills practice. Bottom line is this is mentally demanding stuff. If it's done well, rote practice, you can go through and you're pretty quickly into muscle memory and it doesn't require a lot of effort. But the fact is that if you're doing this effectively, it is hard work. It is not a lot of fun sometimes and it's hard work, but those are kind of the keys. Oops, sorry about that. Those are the keys to moving towards competence, towards excellence, towards mastery. And obviously we know in our training, mastery or excellence is probably a stretch for most of our programs and most of our new students. We know that most EMS providers aren't gonna become excellent at anything while they're in our programs. That's something that most of us took years in the field to really get to that level. Um, but we want to point them in that direction. We want to give them the tools to become those effective learners that they can continue to grow and improve their practice once they're out in the field and continue to improve so that we don't just get them to a competency level and they plateau and stay there out after they're out in the field. So if you want to be good, you got to work hard. I tell my students that all the time. And I tell teachers that if you want to be a good teacher, it is hard work. There is nothing easy about this stuff. It's not like there's a shortcut. That's like with online classes and all these other things. Everybody's looking for an easier way to get this done. And I am convinced if you want your teaching to get better, you just need to work harder. There's no shortcuts. And just the same is for our students. Students don't always pick the difficult path. They tend to pick the path of least resistance, just like most human beings do in most endeavors. But if you want your learning to be effective, you got to be working at it. The things that come super easy and supernatural are usually less effective than the things that require hard work. Um, one other concept I'll throw in here that I think kind of ties into this concept is the idea of scaffolding. And I know if you've been doing education for any amount of time, you've heard of scaffolding. And that I, that's basically the idea that we're creating a support structure teaching people foundation stuff. And once they've got the foundation, you can go up in the scaffolding and provide some more stuff and you can build on it. And eventually they've got the skills where you remove the scaffold and they're able to function well without that assistance. One example I like to use is what we do in scenarios in my program um, is what I call branching scenarios. I don't know if I made that up or we got that, that term from somewhere else. But the idea is that I start out and one example of one we use every year excuse me, in the paramedic classes, we have a pediatric scenario and we have, it comes in, the 911 call is an unknown problem for an infant. And that's all the information they get. They walk into the scene and what they're confronted with is a baby who is fine. The baby, the kid's fine, the parents are hysterical. Parents are freaking out, describe something funny happened with the baby. They are new parents, new baby at home. The parents are just hysterical and difficult to communicate with. And the entire point, the entire objective of the scenario that first time is for them to interact with the parents effectively, reassure them, calm them down in order to get a good story. And then we stop the scenario. It doesn't go any further. And if the students want to know what's wrong with the kid, it doesn't really matter. That scenario is about the parents. We come back to that exact same scenario later, but now we're talking about, it's in the context of, of initial pediatric assessment. We give them the same call, the same scenario, the same hysterical parents, and they handle the hysterical parents really well because they've done that before. They get them calm, they get them reassured, and then they can get in and get a history and assessment. And it's still a kid that's that's fine. Maybe it's a febrile seizure that has stopped and the kid is looking great and they have to manage a febrile seizure. Later, we come back to the same scenario again, everything the same. They manage the hysterical problems, they do the assessment, and now they find this is a kid who's still seizing. Now we have a more serious emergency. Now we can focus on ALS interventions, but we've built them up rather than starting with the full blown pediatric seizure patient, hysterical parents, if you throw all that at new students at one shot, they're likely to, to not do well. We're setting them up for failure because we're giving them way too many things to, to, to work on when we haven't created that foundation to make them be successful. So it kind of ties into what I'll talk about with objectives is that make sure that you're clear that your learning objectives are tied to your scenarios, that you know what you want students to get out of it, and also make sure that they're ready for it. Make sure that the scenario fits the current learning level, the current progression, where they are, so that we don't just throw them the hardest scenario, the toughest call we've been on in years, and leave them a wreck because they just have, are assuming they can't do this job because they didn't get any of it right. We got to do better than that. And my instructors, I know I have a lot of lab instructors and I got a lot of experienced people. And if you don't provide some guidance to those lab instructors or those adjunct instructors that come help you and you say, give them a respiratory scenario. A lot of times our instructors with good intent 
will scratch their head and think, oh, I know the one. I had that call that was, and they go off and they reproduce a scenario of a call that was hard for them as an experienced provider to sort out or figure out what's going on. That's probably not the best teaching scenario for entry level students. You need to work them up to those complex scenarios. Let's see, come on. And make sure my slides are working. All right, so we we talked about deliberate practice. Now I want to talk about contextual learning. And, and the theme here is basically recognizing that if you put your instruction, put your teaching into context that your students are familiar with, they're going to more readily understand it. They're more readily going to assimilate that information and figure out how to apply it in effective ways. And we used to think we accomplished this in the classroom, right? I mean, the way I was taught, the way a lot of us were taught, a lot of way a lot of us taught for a lot long time is we're in a classroom. We've got a carpeted floor, we've got great lighting, we have temperature control, everything's great. And we tell the student, okay, imagine you're on the side of the road. Imagine you're in a ditch, imagine you're in, and we're expecting them to just sort of visualize and picture this environment, assuming that that will translate. We don't wanna spend money on gloves. So we say, well, pretend like you're putting gloves on or tell me that you're putting gloves on instead of actually doing it. We don't require them to wear safety glasses. Whatever steps we cut corners, assuming that they'll just put the pieces together when they get out there. And do they? Sure, of course, we all did. Those of us that learned in a classroom setting, we figured out how to do it, but the actual learning about how to do it happened long after we were in the field. It didn't happen before we got there. And I think as educators, we can do better. The military figured this out a long time ago. And they've been saying for years, train like you will fight, because you will fight like you train. And this applies so much in EMS in that we are putting people through this training in a very controlled setting, and then they're gonna go try to recall and apply these skills in high stress, high pressure situations, often low frequency, meaning they haven't done it for a long time since you taught them. And for us to think that they're all of a sudden gonna do the extra things that they didn't practice is, is absurd, honestly. If we cut corners and do things halfway, when they get presented with those scenarios, they're not gonna all of a sudden decide in the midst of a high pressure situation to step up and do it thoroughly just doesn't work that way. Human nature doesn't work that way. So we need to, we need to do that. So the next question is, how do we do that? How do we create realistic context? How do we create these realistic contextual learning experiences? And, and I think this is worth putting some time and energy into. And this is something that I've been passionate about for about the last six or seven years and really investigating a lot of ways to do this. Um, and I, I, I geek out over some of the technology, but it really isn't about the technology. And I want to talk about that a little bit. So I always ask for definitions, you know, ask an audience to say, tell me about high fidelity. What is that? And since I don't have audience participation here, I'll just kind of throw a couple of things out. And the first is that, I want to tell you what high fidelity is not. It is not about a mannequin. It's not about your training budget and it's not about technology. Although tech can certainly be beneficial, right? I mean, there's some cool tech out there. I'm playing around with the uh, med cognition system. I have a demo set right now that does the hollow lens and you can project an image and, and it's got that oh wow factor. I don't know yet if I've decided that it's a good educational tool or not, but I'll, I'll decide that soon. So I'm not opposed to using technology, but I know a lot of EMS programs are really strapped budgets and really have a difficult time doing that. And, and don't let that limit you from deciding to do high fidelity. Um, the Society for Simulation in Healthcare, SSIH, if you're not familiar with that organization, it's phenomenal. You can sign up for their newsletter for free, or you can become a member and you have access to a bunch of other resources. Um, but really, really cool organization for getting information about simulation and their annual um, conference has more simulation technology than I've ever seen gathered in one place. It's the biggest simulation related event in the world. Um, anyway, um, they define high fidelity as simulation experiences that are extremely realistic and provide a high level of interactivity and realism for the learner. Again, it's about extremely realistic, high level of interactivity and realism. That doesn't say anything about a mannequin. And I would say it, realism and interactivity doesn't come from a plastic patient. I don't care how high tech or expensive it is. That's not where we learn interactivity with a patient. 
I prefer live play, live role players, actors, uh, I think is way better. So the picture you're looking at on the screen um, is a scenario we do early in the paramedic program at my school, just about every year. Um, we call this Jim in a Ditch. Um, that is one of my instructors in the blue shirt there, uh, who is, um, what's all down the front of his shirt is a mix of tequila and SpaghettiOs, um, which he usually has a mouthful of as well, so that when they first roll him over after finding him in the ditch, he sort of spews this airway nightmare at, at them. Um, it's a quick way to, to make sure they're wearing their personal protective equipment and uh, make sure that they're protecting themselves appropriately. Um, but just the little dynamics of having a patient for relatively new students, having a patient head down in a ditch at an angle, they roll him on the board, he slides if they don't anticipate that this guy who's fairly big guy is going to slide downhill when you put him on a board, which is very different than doing it on a flat, dry classroom. Um, and we do this year round, regardless of the weather. And sometimes that ditch has a foot of water in the bottom of it. They still have to navigate that. We do the scenario the same way. Um, this is realistic. This is this is that high level of interactivity and realism. They have to assess a patient, they have to interview a patient, they have to do the logistics. And this is low budget. We just have him go lay in a ditch. You have to find an instructor who's actually willing to lay in a ditch in, regardless of the weather and the temperature. And I think we've made him hypothermic on a couple of occasions because um, we're usually doing this in the fall. Um, but the idea of creating that realism is kind of focused on a few key concepts. And one of the biggest is suspension of disbelief. And you hear about that in, in simulation all the time is suspension of disbelief is getting your students, your students know this isn't real, but you want to make it real enough that they're willing to buy in and treat it like it's real. And when they play it, they don't pretend like it's an instructor. They don't joke and laugh and play around as if this isn't real because they know it's pretend. You got to require your students to engage like this is a real call and this is a real emergency and handle every step of it the way they would. The other thing that I think is important for that is you have to eliminate things like verbalizing. You know, I used to hate the National Registry skill sheets that say they you take body surf or you know the the BSI or verbalizes. Well, or verbalizes doesn't cut it. In our program, if you don't protect yourself, you don't get credit for protecting yourself because you talked about it. Because when you're really doing it in high pressure situations, you just need to do it. Same with every step along the way. You need to be doing everything that you would do if you expect that to translate into actual performance in the field later. And so we, we've eliminated a lot of that. And the other thing that you can do is, is take those extra steps to create realism. And we'll talk about some props and moulage and things like that. Um, and what, a couple of things to think about is sounds. If you're in an, an environment that duplicates what you're doing, great. If not, you can have pre-recorded sounds. There's huge sound file libraries out there on, on, online that you can get, you can get download sounds. If you want the sound of a machine shop, you want the sound of a, of a freeway and busy traffic, whatever you're trying to simulate, sounds help to create that environment. And the other is odors. We know that smell is a powerful link to memory. And all of us who have been doing EMS for a while probably can point to those. I can tell you after 30 plus years, the smell of old dried blood triggers a specific memory to a specific call that I probably will never be able to 100% clear from my memory because of the nature of it. But we know that the memory is tied to smells powerfully. So if you're creating a smell, the fact that he actually uses real tequila to spit all over himself, he smells like a drunk. He doesn't just, we're not telling them to pretend he smells like a drunk. He smells like a tea's drunk. Um, those things make a difference. Um, I'm not promoting any particular products, but Pocket Nurse makes a whole line of odors that come in spray bottles. Be careful you don't leave those in the hands of your students because the, the prank potential is huge. But they have decaying flesh, they have urine, they have feces, they have all these nasty smells. Little spray, and you don't need much of it, in the environment when a student walks into a scenario absolutely changes that level of realism for your students. Powerful stuff. If you're interested in sort of the low cost concepts, this is an article, you can still find it online. I wrote this for GEMS a few years ago, and it's just about that, about ways you can create high fidelity without spending a lot of money. And, and it really, really is possible, very doable. All right, so we talked about deliberate practice, talked about contextual learning, and the next piece I wanna talk about is assessment, which is how do we assess our students? How do we assess a performance in ways that are gonna be effective. And that ties into the next piece, which is, which is feedback. So kind of first thing we talk about is who, who are we assessing and who's doing the assessing? Um, we'll talk about what are we going to assess? 
and how are we going to assess it? So we need to be really deliberate and we need to design processes in our programs that take these into consideration. In other words, for a lot of years, we've done scenarios where we challenge a student to manage the situation. We tell them what they did wrong. We tell them what they did right. We assume they learned from that and we move on to the next thing. That's not really debriefing. That is not really effective in terms of changing behaviors, changing patterns, and effectively bringing out learning. It's got to be a more planned or strategic approach than that. So the who is, we need to assess everybody who's involved in the scenario. So that's team leaders and team members. Um, COE has come up with the accreditation stuff. They've come up with that focus that you got to have people playing those roles. And it makes a lot of sense because we need to know that people can be effective in multiple roles on an emergency scene. And in terms of who does the assessment, I would say that every single person in the vicinity who isn't actively involved in your scenario should be involved in the evaluation. And I'll talk about how we do that in our student run scenarios, because I think it really makes a difference to have a lot of eyes. What are we assessing? This is, comes back to what I mentioned before about objectives. We need to have designed our scenario with a specific thing that we're trying to teach and trying to reinforce. And we need to make sure that our assessment at a minimum includes deciding whether or not that objective was reached or not, whether or not that was accomplished or not. You can obviously expand and in any of our scenarios, there's opportunities to go off on a lot of other things. And if there, those other things are simpler previous things that the students should know at this time, then those absolutely are essential to include. If there are things that are more complex beyond the difficulty or the level that you are right now, they might be good to touch on, but you don't wanna spend all your time talking about things that you'll cover later in your training. You wanna focus on the things that are really at the heart of what that scenario was intended to teach. How we do the observation, I would say again, as much as visual observation as you can get and as many people as you can get, and I'm a huge fan of video capture for scenarios. My students don't like video. Most of my students say they hate being on camera. They hate having the camera pointed at them, but it starts from week one and every scenario we do gets videoed. Um, there's a video recording of every single scenario they do, which means that fairly quickly, they just sort of get used to it. They may still not like it, but they get used to it and they just sort of forget it's there. Almost all of my students tell me when I've surveyed them and reviewed them after is that it's effective. Because what I require, I don't have time to go back and watch all these scenarios again. I barely have time to watch students go through it the first time. And I don't have the resources or the staffing to have people go back and watch videos of students. But the students can watch those videos of their own performance. And I give assignments where they have to go watch a video of their scenario and critique and, and do an evaluation and tell me what things they would do differently or improve. And that process of going back and watching your own performance is powerful. So I think that's great. Where the, the device that's here is called a Padcaster. It's basically just an elaborate holder for an iPad. And on the front of that frame, there's a wide angle lens, which is kind of nice because even in a clat indoor setting in a room, you can get most of the room without having to move the camera. But a lot of times it's a video camera. I mean, it's just a phone. I mean, all of our students have, have pretty sophisticated video um, capability on their phones these days. So you don't have to go high tech. You don't have to buy a lot of stuff to be able to have video um, of, your, of your scenarios and, and use those. And it kind of as a side note, I'll throw out there, you might want to think about if you haven't done that, have someone video you in, when you're teaching. It's a humbling experience. I've done this a number of times where you have a video and just like our students, I realize that they look at it and go, oh, I can't believe I did that. Oh, I didn't know I did that. I'll watch a video of myself teaching and think, why do I keep doing that thing with my, why do I keep touching my chin? That's really stupid. I need to stop doing that. You will notice things that you're not aware of. And so video feedback is a powerful tool uh, that can be really, really helpful. Um, and then what? So we've done an assessment, we've gathered all this information, we're watching whether or not things are done, and then we need to decide what we're gonna do with that information. This has a fractured fibula, given about seven, so we can be able to go on tomorrow. Dad is gonna be so excited. That killed him. So the, the point of the video is don't judge too quickly. 
And don't be so quick to get into that judgment mode. I think we have a real tendency as experienced providers to pretty quickly see what's wrong, see what got missed. And we want to, it's just instinctive. We want to jump in there and correct it, right? We want to point it out, but we need to be cautious and we need to be slow and we need to use a deliberate process in order for the learning to be effective. Because what we know is me telling a student what they did wrong is not likely to stick. A student figuring out what they did wrong is much more likely to be something they will retain, learn from, and move on. The instructor, the experienced person, the expert telling them how they screwed up is often internalized as this process of, oh, I'm just not smart enough. I'm not going to be able to do this. I can't believe it. Maybe I should go back to truck driving. Who knows what's going on internally? All they know is they messed up when it's coming from you as a negative message. Entirely different learning process than if we allow students to discover that learning for themselves, which is what I want to talk about next. And the debriefing process, I would argue, is that is where most of the learning happens related to simulations and scenarios. The vast majority of what they learn, what they're going to retain, and what they're going to be able to apply later comes through a process of reflection where they have the opportunity to think through it, process it, and go, oh, I get it. We've all seen that, right? You have that. We've all had that. You have that aha moment where in your brain, not because someone told you, but because you put the pieces together, you reach a point where you go, oh, now I get it. Okay, I see where I went wrong here. That stuff sticks. That's how we learn as human beings in ways that we can actually duplicate or recall and do in the future. Um, so we want students to process it. We want to think them to think about it. We want them to talk about it. We want to work through it. And if we can allow them to do that learning for themselves, rather than us telling them what they did right or wrong, it's going to be more effective. And that has been proven in numerous studies, in numerous settings, in numerous disciplines. This stuff works, but you got to overcome that instinctive response that we have instru as instructors to just Tell them, oh, here's what you did right, here's what you did wrong, and assume that now we've covered it and we move on. Makes us feel good, we've checked the boxes, we've covered the content, and they're not likely to retain it. We as instructors need to be facilitators, right? We need to facilitate that reflection. We need to give them the opportunity to process it, think about it, figure out what they need to learn out of it, and allow them to learn that. It gives them that framework that's needed for them to actually learn. When you look at a bunch of the neurological studies, we have some pretty good information about how neural pathways are formed. And it really has to do with applying new learning to previous knowledge and connecting up those neural pathways in a way that you can go back and use them again. And that is not a process that human beings do well when someone else tells them what they should be thinking or what they should be doing. They do it much better. We all do it much better when we figure out for ourselves what works and what doesn't. That's just the nature of learning. All right. So one of the things that I do, um, I picked this up from my friend, Chris Krobos. Some of you probably know Chris. He works with iSimulate. He's also um, with the Fairfax um, County Fire, um, used to run their paramedic program. He's since moved up in the ranks. But this is a self-reflection form, and I copied his and used a very similar one for us. And what I do at the end of a scenario is I hand this form to the students. The students get done running the scenario, and the group of students who were running the call, whether that's one, two, three, four people, however many, rather than have them restock their equipment or put set things up for the next group, I hand them this form and I send them off to go have a little powwow. And I will, the, the, in our program, the expectation is the instructor and the role player, whoever you have for a patient, put things back together, get things restocked, ready for the next group. While these guys have a few minutes, you know, it doesn't take a, a lot, maybe five minutes, maybe 10 to go off on their own and do a quick review and discussion by themselves. No instructor input, no instructor involvement. Give them a chance to sort of unwind, think about what just happened, talk about it in their group, identify the things that they felt went well and not, and then bring them back, and then we start the debrief process. Night and day difference since we started doing this compared to what we always used to do was we wrap up the call, we say, okay, here's what you did right, here's what you did wrong, tell me what you think kind of stuff. This prompts them to do most of that process. And what's interesting is they figure out most of the stuff you wanted to tell them about anyway on their own. So when you bring them back together, I love starting out this way, which is just walk me through the call. Tell me what happened. 
You came in, what were you thinking? What did you do? Why were you doing that? And, and not challenging each thing, not right or wrong, not running down that checklist that they just did. They've done the checklist. I don't want them to give me a list of right and wrong. I want them to walk me through that experience so they can relive it sort of and think about choices. At this point, we could have done A or B. Here's where I went. Here's what I should have been thinking about. Fight the urge to tell them what they did wrong or tell them what they did right. Let them figure it out. And one of the keys to this that I think is really important that sometimes we miss is we tend to focus on EMS because we're very task oriented in a lot of situations. It's not as important what they did as why they did it. What was their thought process? If I'm thinking that the first thing that needed to happen was airway management and they didn't go there for a while, then I need to know why. I don't need to just jump in and say, well, airway should have happened first. I need to say, okay, so what was going on? What were you dealing with? And why did you go to the wound first? And hearing them think that, well, I thought that was a life critical thing. It looked like a significant amount of bleeding. I thought I needed to deal with that first. Okay, we can work with that and redirect it as opposed to me deciding for myself that they don't understand where A compares to C in their priority list. And so clearly I just need to tell them to do this. They need to put it in context. And for that to happen, we need to know what the thought process was. We need to know how they got to that decision to do that action rather than focusing on the action that they did. And that's a lot more powerful in terms of how they're going to apply that. Um, if they discover it on their own, it's more likely to stick. And the last thing I'll say about that debriefing is I've heard a lot of um, different analogies for this idea that, well, you tell them, tell them something positive tell them what they need to improve on, and then wrap up with something positive at the end. And that's a reasonable idea. Kind of the crass way to refer to that is a shit sandwich. Doesn't matter how sweet the bread is on either side. If the stuff in the middle is really foul, they're going to walk away with a bad taste in their mouth. And so I think you need to kind of keep that in context, right? I think we need to Think about this in a strategic way that just throwing some nice stuff front and back, they're not going to care. They're not going to listen to that. They're going to focus on the message they didn't like. But if they get to that area for improvement on their own and figure out how to respond to it, they're more likely to actually change their behaviors or their approach the next time around. All right, so now let's get into the, the, the meat of this as far as the um, simulation itself. And there's a whole list of things that are required for simulation. And you can look at a lot of different references out there. Um, and they're pretty similar kind of an outline that you have to have learning objectives, which I've already talked about, right? We've talked about learning objectives and that's key. And you have to have a setting, you have to have a story, you have to have a patient, some kind of moulage or props, somebody to facilitate this thing. And you have to have an assessment and feedback process. And I would ask, what do you think you have to do as an instructor? Or do you as an instructor have to be responsible for all of this? And the way most of our programs have been structured, the answer is yes, that's my job. My job is to figure out every bit of this and that's time consuming and it's intensive and it's difficult. Well, I would just encourage you to think about the fact that you as an instructor need to have objectives. You need to know what the point of the scenario is and you need to set some parameters for the rest of it to kind of keep people within the boundaries, keep them between the ditches um, so your students don't end up going too far astray. But students can do all the rest of this. You can absolutely have your students do the majority of this work. And I'll kind of give an example of that. So using this in place of lectures is incredibly powerful. I started doing this quite a few years ago and it's, it's actually a lot of fun. So rather than lecture on four topics, for example, so I do four hour lecture sessions um, for our paramedic class, that's kind of our set schedule, which can be brutal. We have to break it up and use some variety. But I used to top, do say, pick a topic randomly, environmental emergencies. So I might spend four hours talking about hypothermia and heat related emergencies and, and the different categories and and it's just me talking and you know trying to keep it in, engaging and interactive. But what I do now for that particular lecture is I tell the students ahead of time that we're going to cover environmental emergencies and it's going to be all scenarios. And so I have the scenarios, um, the categories predefined. I have the objectives predefined. And that's what I share with each group of students. So I put students into groups and I tell each group privately, they're not allowed to share that information with the others, what sort of a topic they're going to research and present to their classmates. And each group is gonna have a different environmental emergency that they're responsible for. And so their assignment for the week, and you don't have to read this, I can, if anybody wants it, I'll, I'll tell you at the end, I can share anything that I've got with anybody that would like it. But I hand them this assignment that says that you're gonna be divided into groups. 
And you need to do the reading about all the environmental emergencies. You need to be ready to respond to any environmental emergency that you might get thrown in your scenario. But your group specifically is going to do a hypothermia scenario, for instance. Here's your this. Here's the objectives. And I leave the rest of it up to them. And then when we meet as a class, we divide the class into groups and one group is going to be presenting the scenario that they created. One group is going to be responding to the call as we typically have students do in a scenario. And then everybody else is going to be evaluating. And I spell those roles out a little more completely for folks in that the people who are presenting it have to develop the scenario in advance and they have to include that detail. So they need to look up appropriate medications for that particular disease process. They may have to come up with an appropriate history that fits that profile. They need to find a, create that story and they need to have a patient. When I do this in my class, I require the students to bring a patient and it can't be one of their classmates. It can be a student they found on campus. It can be a friend, it can be a family member. I've had students bring grandparents. It's, and the people they can talk into this are usually people who are more than willing to do some acting and, and have fun with it, which makes for some phenomenal free help in, in running your scenarios. So they create the patients, they create the moulage and the props. And with the patient, I tell them it has to be at least an attempt to make it age appropriate to fit the scenario that they've created. Um, moulage and props, we have a lot of moulage. And again, moulage is one of the things you can spend a ton of money on elaborate moulage, or you can do some really basic things that are really cheap and create a level of realism that a lot of times we just kind of blow past. And what I find is that when I let the students create these things, they are way more creative than I am. For one thing, you've got a whole group of people working on each of the scenarios. They got a lot of energy. They got a grade involved. They put some energy into creating some awesome scenarios. And I require them to submit an outline of the scenario to me before the day we do it, just so I can vet it a little bit, make sure that the vitals make sense for the presentation and that kind of thing. But they do the vast majority of the work. Also, during the scenario, we use the iSimulate system, the iSimulate reality system for our monitors. And so the students all know how to run those facilitators. They run that so they can do the inputs for changes to vital signs, any of that kind of stuff. So I really have them doing the work. The responders are what we normally do, right? They have to come prepared with a fully stocked bag and appropriate response gear. We give them their iSimulate monitor and a gurney and an oxygen tank, and they bring all their stuff um, ready to respond to the scenario. They decide on roles. So they pick who's going to be the team lead, who's going to be a team member. Sometimes they get very specific of who's the new airway, who's doing IV and meds, that kind of thing. Um, and then they run the call, right? They just kind of come in, run the call, communicate clearly so the evaluators um, can hear what's being said. Um, and then the last is evaluators, and that's everybody else. I always assign one person to do the video and they're not required to take notes or anything else. They're just required to capture anything of interest that's going on. And as I said, if you don't have your own video capture system, have someone volunteer that's got a phone and it works really well. Um, I assign some people to evaluate the team leader. I assign some people to evaluate each of the team members. And basically I just say, watch everything. It's amazing how much more they pick up on when you've got, you've got eight, 10, 12 people watching a scenario instead of just you as the instructor trying to watch all of those things, you will get a lot more comprehensive review and feedback than you will ever get trying to do that role just by yourself, even with a couple of instructors. So if they're doing all the work, what do you do? The instructor is doing the facilitation, which means what I'm facilitating is I'm facilitating the debriefing process. I'm there and available to sort of interject if needed for the scenarios, but I rarely have to. I rarely have to change because they do a pretty you know, awesome job, especially once we've done this once in the class and they understand how this process goes. They get very good at facilitating this. So I really have to facilitate the debriefing and I allow the students to be to take the lead on that as well, because if we've modeled that well, they kind of figure out how to do that. But I may need to redirect a little bit to make sure that the responders have the opportunity to take the lead as I already discussed. It also gives me an opportunity as an instructor to explore the what ifs. So for instance, a heat related emergency, as I mentioned, if what they presented was someone in heat exhaustion, we can talk about that. And then after we've debriefed and talked about that, I can throw out the hypothetical to say, okay, so that was heat exhaustion. What other findings would you have to have to make a decision that this is actually heat stroke and we need to go down that treatment path and then make that a discussion to explore that. If it's hypothermia, we can go, well, what if the temperature was this much or you saw these things? Does that change our treatment? Does it change our interventions? So you can explore all those other avenues that you would normally talk about in a lecture 
but now you're exploring them in a context that the students just watched, just were involved in and understand. And the people watching, the other evaluators, everyone is actively involved in a role throughout this whole thing, which is what makes it so powerful. So again, I'll share this. When I set up in a four hour class, I do about 15 minutes to present, 15 minutes to debrief, about 10 to 15 minutes to reset for the next group. And so it takes about 40 minutes for each group to work through. We run through and then we've got time at the end to do kind of a wrap up sort of thing. So in terms of planning out these scenarios, one of the questions that I've had before is how long does it take? How long do your students need to do this kind of thing? And what I've done traditionally in my program since we started this is I give them a one or two weeks to prepare. Um, and that's more than necessary, but it gives them some time to plan, to get their group together, to do some research, to put together, to recruit a patient, that sort of thing. That's, that's kind of how I've structured it. And that is more than enough time for students to put together some pretty, excuse me, to put together some pretty impressive scenarios. I have, my, my friend Chris tells me that he does it in 30 minutes. So what he does is in the middle of a class, they'll come in and he'll say, okay, put them in their group, say you have 30 minutes, you're gonna prepare a scenario. And he walks around and he hands each group a card and say, this is your scenario, go. And one person's looking up meds and history and vital signs. One person's finding them, running around finding moulage, they're doing whatever. And they in 30 minutes put together a scenario and then they run through exactly what I just described. And he says it's effective. I haven't been bold enough yet to throw together, to ask my students to throw together scenarios in 30 minutes. I suspect they'd be less comprehensive, but the reality is that from what Chris tells me, they're not much less creative. They, they do this really well. And again, it's all about getting them engaged and this will engage them thoroughly. They may not go in huge depth into all the different environmental emergencies, but I guarantee you, the one that they are presenting, they are going to dig into, find the details, make sure they really understand what that looks like, and study that one in a depth that they probably wouldn't have looked at any of them if it was just preparing for another lecture session. So as I'm kind of wrapping this up, benefits gives them better understanding patient presentations. If they're doing role play, they get a better appreciation for what it's like to be a patient and the way we handle them. We have lots of evaluators that I talked about and we're actively integrating them in multiple aspects of the process, which means they're learning throughout the whole thing in each of those different roles, which I think is probably why this works so well. A couple things I'll mention real quick. I won't spend any time on this, but you can do this online. We learned this last year. I was doing these type of things. It's a little awkward. It's a little weird, but I had one person being a team leader, somebody else on, you know, all on Zoom. I had people doing the different roles, talking to each other, assigning tasks, other people being evaluators. I was putting a picture up on the screen of a patient in a scene. Um, you can do it. It's a little bit challenging, but you can do it. Um, since we're running out of time, I want to leave some time for questions at the end here. I will mention this. As part of my uh, master's degree, um, sort of my final capstone project, I created what I call an EMS Educators Toolkit. And I'll share uh, a link here in a second to my webpage. Um, and there's also links there, presentations I do and different things. Um, and a contact me. If there's any of this information that you want, go to my webpage and go to the Contact Me tab and um, and send me an email and let me know what you want. If it's a copy of this presentation, copy of any of those little documents that I shared, any of that kind of stuff, I'm happy to share. Um, and the toolkit is basically, I put together a bunch of information about different teaching strategies, some of the science behind them, a lot of references to where a lot of this information comes from. And it's just there to share freely with anybody that might benefit from it. So if that's helpful to you, awesome. Um, if you hate it, um, don't tell me, you just hurt my feelings. Um, but if you see something that I can improve or something that would be more helpful, um, feel free to share that as well. And thank you for your time. I hope this was helpful. Um, and I challenge you, get out there and try new things. Don't try to overhaul your whole program in one fell swoop because that's usually a disaster. But start doing some incremental changes. If you haven't done these kind of things, try it out with one topic, one class, one session, try some different things, create some high fidelity experiences, um, and, and have fun with it. The QR code that's on the screen right now will take you to my webpage, um, or you can go to the website that's right there as well. And like I said, I, I, in all my presentations I do anywhere, I always say I will share anything 
um, that I've got with any EMS educator that can benefit from it. I, it's not proprietary. I'm not trying to make money off the stuff I've figured out. I just like to like to share with people when I can. So I've got a, just a few minutes left. Does anybody have any questions? I haven't seen any in the chat box or questions, comments, anything anybody wants to share? Stunned silence. I like that, just like with my classes. Okay. <laughs> I guess if there's no questions, a lot of compliments though, that's good. <laughs> awesome. Well, good. I'm glad. Yeah, a couple of, couple of thank yous there and you're all very welcome. I hope that's that's great. And like I said, I will, I will share information and there's actually quite a, quite a lot of information about some of those strategies and some of the stuff I talked about is also things I talked about in that, um, on that website that I created. So good stuff if you're interested. Perfect. Um, well, if that's everything, then I think we're good. Um, Gary, thank you so, so much for this. Really appreciate it. Um, fantastic presentation. Oh, I'm so sorry. I have the hiccups. <laughs> Um, and I'm glad that didn't happen to me while I was doing it. That I know, I'm sitting here thinking, I was like, really, of all times. <laughs> um, but the link to register for the CEU, um, I put it up in, excuse me, up in the chat further. Um, mm -hmm. It will also be in the email that everyone will get tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, well, again, thank you so much, Gary. Welcome. Thanks for having me and take care. Enjoy the rest of your summer. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.